Yeah, you can go when you're ready, they say. Okay. Well, on behalf of the uh, Dublin Institute for Advanced uh, Studies, or DIAS, as we call it, uh, I want to welcome you all to this evening's lecture. Uh, my name is uh, John Hegarty, and I have the honor of being the chair of the Dublin Institute. Um, before we start, um, just maybe uh, a brief word on DIAS itself and what it's about. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the Dublin Institute, uh, as the name says, we are an independent institute for advanced studies and research uh, right in the heart of uh, Dublin City. Uh, we've been around for over 80 years at this stage and belong to a, a global family of uh, such institutes. Uh, in fact, we're the second institute that was established of its kind in the world after the one in uh, Princeton. Uh, and we are certainly the only one in Ireland. So we're unique in this country. Uh, what do we do? Well, our focus is fundamental research, um, uh, pure and simple, uh, conducted in three schools. Uh, in our School of Theoretical Physics, as you might imagine, uh, understanding the mathematical principles of the natural world is to the fore. Uh, the School of Cosmic Physics, um, comprising astronomy, astrophysics, and geophysics, uh, the goal is to understand our universe, our planet, our island, a pretty broad range from the ultra large to the relatively small. And finally, in the School of Celtic Studies, uh, the drive is to gain insights into Celtic society and this very rich legacy. Now, I would stress in line with um, modern research uh, that the Institute is strongly networked internationally. It is involved in several international projects uh, in, in the area of astronomy, astrophysics, and geophysics that leads Ireland's participation in some of those uh, projects. Uh, one a good example that's been in the news recently is the Webb Space Telescope, which was launched in Christmas Day 2021 uh, with great excitement. Uh, now, the Institute uh, has a global reach, a global vi uh, view, but it does not ig ignore the uh, local needs. Uh, for example, uh, when you hear about uh, earthquake tremors off the northwest of this country of Donegal or in the Irish Sea, uh, that data comes from the Irish National Seismic Network, which is run by the Institute for Advanced Studies. Uh, Dunsink Observatory on the outskirts of Dublin uh, is part of uh, DIAS and is a scientific and cultural gem. It's a wonderful place to visit uh, and it engages the broader community and the wonders of science. So if you want to learn more about what's going on in the Institute, uh, please, you can look at the chat box. Uh, there, are, there are contact details there for social media, for the website. So uh, do not be shy. Uh, and so um, to this evening's uh, proceedings, uh, the Dias uh, Day Lecture was inaugurated in 2020 as an initiative uh, to mark the 80th anniversary of the foundation of DIAS. And again, I'm delighted to welcome you all uh, to this third event. Uh, particularly delighted uh, to welcome our guest speaker, Dr. Elizabeth Bick, and our master of ceremonies, uh, Sean Duke. Uh, Sean is a science journalist and author. For those of you in Ireland, uh, you will probably recognize him from his contributions on science issues in the Irish Times, on radio, uh, and on other media outlets. Uh, Sean is going to act as uh, MC, so I'll pass over to him, to Sean, to tell you a little bit more about Elizabeth and this evening. So, Sean. Thank you. Thank you, John. So this is one I'm really looking forward to as a journalist and as a science journalist. Uh, we'll just do a little intro now to Elizabeth Elizabeth Bick. She's a PhD. She's a Dutch microbiologist. She has worked for 15 years at Stanford University in the US and two years in industry. Since 2019, she is a science integrity volunteer and consultant who scans the medical biomedical literature for images and other data of concern and has reported 6,000 scientific papers at this stage. Her work has resulted in 800 retracted and over 1,000 corrected papers, 
And for her work on exposing threats to research integrity, she received the 2021 John Maddox Prize. Uh, we're already seeing some questions coming in. So this, this is obviously a very interesting topic and a very interesting speaker. Uh, just a reminder before I turn over to Elizabeth, uh, the lecture is being recorded. Uh, we will take questions, of course, at the end. If you'd like, you can send them now uh, to communications at dias.ie. That's communications at dias.ie. So over to Elizabeth. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Sean. That is uh, great. Let me start sharing my screen. So I hope you can see my screen now. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm both a microbiologist as well as a science integrity consultant. And so my Twitter handle, if you'd like to follow me, is uh, Microbiome Digest, uh, sort of a legacy to my past working in the microbiome field. And uh, the work that I do is basically criticizing other people's, uh, other scientists' work. And so obviously I uh, need to disclose my conflicts of interest because that is one of the things I sometimes find uh, flaws in a paper where people do not close, disclose their conflicts of interest. So I want to start off by making sure that I disclose how I make my money. This is a, a question I get a lot. So I am a consultant. I'm not employed by a university or another institution. I am a consultant and so I earn um, some money by giving talks, by, giving, uh, by getting speakers honoraria and by doing consulting work for publishers, lawyers sometimes, and institutions who might investigate a particular uh, case, uh, some allegations of misconduct, and I might be called in as an expert witness. And so that is how I make some of my money. I uh, also have worked at a company called Ubiome, which um, now that the founders are being charged with insurance fraud. Uh, so the company was raided by the FBI and uh, I, uh, worked at that company, but uh, the, it's the founders who have been charged with, um, with the fraud, not any of the other employees. And so the case is, um, I believe, still under investigation, but I do have four patents from that time. And yes, I have worked on that with that company, so that will be on my resume forever. I also have a Patreon account. Uh, this is actually where I get most of my income currently. These are mainly people who uh, who are scientists themselves. And so often they only can spend maybe one or two or five euros or dollars per month. And they support my work and that comes without any conditions. I often get asked if, if uh, some of these sponsors on Patreon are stockholders of certain companies that I might criticize. And to the best of my knowledge, that's not the case. I also do not own any stock in, in any company. I have like a regular... 401k fund that is invested, but I don't have any stocks. So um, with that, hopefully out of the way, I also would like to credit a lot of other people who do similar work. So there's many people who um, devote part of their time to finding problems in scientific papers. So they might either focus on statistical errors, they might focus on um, uh, plagiarism, on images like I do, or they provide the platforms that we can use to discuss or report these issues. And, and so there's many of them. Uh, I've listed a bunch of them here or on Twitter, um, but I, I don't wanna take all the credit for uh, some of the work I'll be presenting because this is often a team effort where one person might see something and another person offers some extra expertise like everything in science. It's often about collaborations and uh, working on a problem together. Um, and why do all of us care about scientific papers? Because you might think that once a paper has been, has gone through peer review and has been published, it is sort of set in stone. You, would, you could argue that a paper has already been looked at and there shouldn't be any problems left, but that's not the case. Um, we think, all of us uh, think that science should be about finding the truth and, and scientists build upon each other's work. So, we, we sort of could, could look at scientific publications as building blocks, as bricks in the wall of science, because each of us scientists build upon the work of uh, scientists previously to us. We, we all work on this giant legacy of scientific papers, and we use scientific papers 
to start our research, to base our research on, and other people will hopefully take our results and then work with that. So publications are sort of bricks in a wall, and we all build upon each other's work. And uh, But if, if one of those bricks, one of those publications contains an error or contains even fraudulent data or suspected fraudulent data, that might mean that other pub publications that are based on that paper might also be flawed. And so we feel that it's very important if we discover a potential concern about a paper that we raise that issue and that papers are not set in stone and that as scientists, we should be able to criticize those papers and those papers should be corrected or even retracted. Now, most science is built on trust. I, I feel I was also very naive a couple of years ago before I started doing this work. And I feel most scientists are blindly trusting each other. If we peer review a paper, we, we uh, usually do not doubt that the data presented in that paper might be fraudulent. But unfortunately, like in any other field you can think of, science is not immune to fraud. There is fraud in science. And so some of my talk will, will go on that, but I do want to point out that most scientists are honest. And uh, I, I'm only going to talk about a specific fraction of papers that have potential problems. And not all problems that we see are necessarily fraud as well. So what is science misconduct? Now the definitions might vary a little bit per country or per university, but in general, we sort of distinguish between what we could call questionable research practices. So basically doing science, but doing it in a way that is not completely proper and, and uh, good. For example, we could think about uh, papers or studies that are being done, but not reporting negative results, only focusing on the positive things, not citing relevant papers, maybe picking the wrong statistical test, and maybe doing that a little bit on purpose, sloppiness, ethical concerns, all those things are not good for, for sure, and we should still point them out, but they're not necessarily science misconduct. So sloppiness, uh, for example, not labeling things very well and, and picking the wrong image, or the wrong data set, uh, it's not necessarily fraud um, because it's done unintentionally. And of course, as scientists, we should not be sloppy, but it's not always science misconduct. Uh, so in the US, at least, science misconduct is defined as one of three things, plagiarism, falsification, or fabrication, where I think most people are familiar with plagiarism. That is copying each other's texts or ideas without giving proper credit. Um, because we all work on each other's work, we should always credit other people who have done the work before us and not just steal their ideas. So I did work on plagiarism uh, in the past. That's sort of how I started um, being interested in science misconduct. And I found about 80 papers with plagiarized texts. But then I also realized, and I'll show this in a minute, that that's maybe not as bad for science as a whole. It's bad for the scientist who does not get credit, but it's not necessarily bringing new false ideas into science. While falsification and fabrication, in my opinion, are a little bit worse than plagiarism. Um, so falsification is where a person obtains results, but changes the results a little bit. For example, uh, a value that falls just under a threshold and would be considered a negative, if you raise the value a little bit, it becomes a positive and makes your result maybe look better. And so that would be called falsification or maybe leaving out an outlier, a result that doesn't quite fit your hypothesis, oh, just leave it out. And then the other results look better um, uh, as a whole. Now fabrication is, is even, even worse. That is where a person completely makes up results. And if you think about it, how easy is it to just type in some numbers in an Excel spreadsheet and make a nice graph without doing an experiment? That is fabrication. That is completely making up results. And so these things together are, are science misconduct. But why would people do science misconduct? Uh, I don't think anybody starts their career in science by thinking, ah, let's do some fraud in science. I think most scientists start uh, their career in science because they are interested in science and finding the truth. Why would somebody who is interested in finding the truth suddenly to fraud. And I can think of several scenarios and all of them have to do with the pressure to publish. Um, but 
And this pressure can vary a little bit uh, on our career stage or in the country in which we work. Um, but in general, the pressure to publish uh, doesn't always necessarily lead to, to fraud. But if the incentives are very strong in a particular country, for example, you need to publish a paper in order to get your PhD, or you need to publish uh, 10 papers a year in order to, to become a professor. I'm just making up some things, but you can see that these, if you have very strict requirements to publish papers, we might all be tempted to publish positive results only, or to even fabricate some data. Now that's a very general scenario, but there's two specific scenarios that I think are happening also quite a lot. So one I call the taste of success, which is where uh, a person was very successful early in their career. Maybe they, they won, won some awards, they discovered something great, they, were, uh, they had a publication in Science and Nature, they uh, were on national television, and they had the taste of success. But now they moved on to a slightly different research project, and suddenly the research and the results aren't as beautiful. And so I think that's a scenario where a person has tasted success, wants to fulfill all the expectations that people have and might be tempted to tweak the results and to change them a little bit. And the third scenario that I hear a lot about is what I call the power play. This is a situation in which a young uh, early career scientist, maybe uh, a graduate student or a postdoc, is working in a lab with, um, where the group leader, the professor is a bully. And the professor demands results, demands a particular test to work, demands uh, that the results fits their own hypothesis and puts so much pressure on the young uh, scientists that they are tempted to, uh, to make up results in order to keep their job. Because in academia, we're so dependent on what uh, our seniors think of us as juniors that, uh, yeah, if we, if we resist too much, if we do not uh, make the professor happy, then we might be fired. And this is particularly true, I believe, uh, for example, in the, v in the US where people are on a visa. And if you are fired, you would need to immediately leave the country, go back to your home country uh, within five days. And so this is an enormous pressure to, if a, if a professor threatens to fire you, uh, you know, produce these results or else, then they might be tempted to do fraud. And so these are some scenarios. And I, I realize there's always very sad uh, stories behind the scenes of misconduct. And I try to make it about the papers and the figures. We can have some fun with that. But I try not to make fun of the people um, who, who are the authors on these papers. Often you do not know whose role, um, uh, who, who did what in, in the paper. And we might not know or be familiar with the very sad situation behind the scenes. Now, I started this work by um, working on plagiarism. And then by accident, I discovered um, a set of papers uh, produced by the same uh, first author and last author. And I recognized the particular image. So I recognize this particular Western blot. I hope you can see my cursor. Um, it had uh, four. It's a protein, protein uh, band. It's a Western blot. So there's four bands and there's a big stain in the background, which was recognizable. And I, I saw another, um, uh, another paper from the same group. And here, there it was again, the same stain, the same little dot there in the fourth lane. But now we're looking at six lanes and it's actually a very different experiment. If you look at the labels, these are representing very different experiments. And then there was a third occurrence where the same blot also was uh, used, but now it was flipped, it was mirrored. And, and so these different orientations uh, may at first uh, make you to think that these are different experiments, but was the same blot. And so this seemed to have been done intentional, especially with flipping an image to make it look different that seemed to be intentionally done. And so I reported these papers and they were actually quickly retracted. The editor agreed with me that this was not good and these papers uh, were retracted. And I realized I had some talent of finding duplicates in uh, biomedical papers. And so I have a biomedical background, but if you, if you think about images in papers, they might look like uh, images on the left, they might be a plot of some kind, what I call line graphs, or they might be photos. Now in the biomedical field, photos are 
a little bit more common than in some other fields. If you think about chemistry or math or physics papers, they might not have a lot of photos. But if they have photos, we can look at these photos and recognize, for example, that all these photos are unique. Uh, you might look at a bunch of mice or a bunch of panels, and all of these samples, all of these panels are different from each other. And our, our uh, uh, eye and brains are so focused on visual information, we can look at these things, we can recognize patterns, we can see that all these lanes are fine and all are unique. Now with line graphs, it's much easier to fake these. Like I can just, you know, I don't necessarily have to do an experiment to produce this graph. I could just type in some numbers. So I don't really know what the amount of fraud is in, in line graphs. Although I know that two of these graphs are my own. So uh, I, I know this data is real and I can show it. But photos are a little bit harder to, to fake. Although of course technology has improved rapidly, but in general, you can look at photos and, and maybe pick up on duplications. And so that's what I started to do. And I realized there's, there's all kinds of duplications that you could see in published peer reviews, peer reviewed papers. And so here are some examples of duplications that I found. And there's different categories. So category one is a simple duplication where you see a bunch of panels, but some panels might be exactly the same. Now, this is this could be an honest error. Um, and I wanna point out that this is not necessarily science misconduct. It could just be sloppiness. Somebody didn't label their, their, their images very well and they by accident picked the same photo to represent two different experiments. Now, if you go to these two examples here on the right, these are repositioned duplications. So you see, for example, here, four panels are representing cells being uh, treated with different amount of radiation. And so we would expect for different photos but these two top photos and these two right photos overlap with each other. And so instead of looking at four photos, we're actually only looking at best at two specimens. And um, this overlap also with a change in aspect ratio is suggestive for an intention to mislead. But of course, this is up to the editor to investigate. And similarly here um, on the bottom right is an example of a repositioned Western blot where two Western blots appear to overlap with each other um, even though they represent different proteins in different cellular locations. And so, but it's the same photo. Now, moving on to the bottom left is an example of a duplication with an alteration. Now, this is a category where uh, the duplication is within a photo. It's not just two overlapping photos. There's duplicated elements within a photo. This could be cells or nanoparticles, or in this case, a Western blot band. And so panel A, for example, lane one and lane three appear to look identical, while in panel D, three lanes appear to look identical. And this is very suggestive of an intention to mislead. If you don't quite know what these, these photos mean, this would be the equivalent of looking at a photo of a dinner party and seeing your aunt um, Emma three times in the same photo. That is unexpected. You would not expect the same person to be visible two or three times in the same photo unless maybe they have a twin, but if you happen to know that there's no, no twin sister uh, involved, then it would be very unexpected to see the same elements within the same photo. So this is very suggestive of Photoshopping and very suggestive of an intention to mislead. This is the type three duplication. So these three categories are helpful to look at images and sort of spot duplications. So the next couple of slides, I will present some examples of duplications. And so this is a type one duplication. And maybe some of you are very good in seeing these duplications and some of you are need a little bit of help. But if you, if you uh, go along, maybe it'll get better in, in the next uh, couple of slides. So if you look at this photo, um, there's a couple of duplications here that you might've spotted. And the duplication are here, the one micromolar and five micromolar image in both the top row and the bottom row are identical. This is unexpected, but it's the same photo being used. So this is a simple duplication. And I reported this to the journal, expecting this to be quickly corrected. But unfortunately, as of today, this paper has not been corrected. So the editor did not take any action, did not write uh, to the authors. And so this, this paper is still out there with its duplication. Here's another example of a type one duplication. There's a bunch of panels here that are all looking similar. You sort of have to let your eye wander over all these panels and uh, do a pairwise comparison. 
And then you might come to the conclusion that two panels um, also look identical to each other. But if you look at the labels, they're supposed to be different. So I reported this to the journal in October 2015. This I reported a bunch of papers in that time. I did a very um, uh, coordinated search of, of these types of duplications by picking random journals and, and um, issues and looking at all the, the images. So this paper got actually quickly corrected. The, edit, the author said, oh yes, sorry, we used the, the wrong photo. And this is how it should be. The, the authors quickly replaced the photo with the correct photo. And um, in this case, yeah, that was a correction and that's a good outcome. I mean, it's just a small error, but it should be corrected and, um, and, and it was. Here's an example of a type two duplication. So here we're looking at four different panels. The, uh, I believe these are uh, photos of kidneys um, of, of mice being treated with different uh, uh, treatments. And so they should all be different, but there's two photos that overlap. So this is an overlap. It's not the exact same photo being used twice. There's an overlap between images. So the sample was shifted under the microscope. And so the duplication is here in the bottom two. These two panels representing two different experiments uh, are actually not. These photos are from the same kidney, the same cells. And so these photos should not be looking, uh, should not be, have an overlap. And again, is this an honest error or not? This is a little bit more difficult uh, than the category one duplication, um, but it should be to the, to the least, it should be corrected. But I reported this also in October, 2015. I did a bunch of papers then to the journal and it has not been uh, addressed. This paper is again, still out there with its duplication. Now, sometimes these duplications can get quite complex. And so here we're looking at photos of cells that are uh, either invasive or migrating. It's like a particular assay to, to look if a cell can grow fast. And that's a, a measure for, for example, a cancer cell. Can we inhibit a cancer cell with a particular compound? And so that's what they did. So if you see a lot of cells, it's a cancerous cells, but if you're treating it, you would expect fewer cells. And so the amount of cells, um, so, so for example, here you see not, not a lot of cells and here you see a very thick layer of cells. So these are cancerous cells and these are also cancerous cells being treated with something, you see fewer cells. Anyway, these photos should all look different, but they're not, there's actually lots of overlapping images here and this is, this is beyond what I think is sloppiness. If you make so many mistakes in your photos, then your, I have serious doubts about all your data in that paper, because that means that, that these scientists were very sloppy. They didn't take good, uh, didn't use good quality measures to keep track of all their photos. And so I reported this online. Um, uh, this one I didn't directly report to the to the editors yet, but there's no action taken yet. This paper is still out there, and um, yeah, it's cited nine times, which is not a lot. But you know, nine people might have based their research on this paper, and I feel that's a waste of money. I would not trust any results from this lab. Here's a type two duplication in a Western blot. Um, you see a bunch of panels here that are all supposed to be different proteins and different experimental conditions. And so uh, these two panels appear to look the same, but they were flipped uh, like over the horizontal axis. While the two gap DH panels also appear to look the same, but they were stretched a little bit. So both are type two duplications and these are suggestive for an intention to mislead. I reported this to the institution and the journal in 2019, but this paper is still out there, has not been addressed. And um, yeah, uh, would be easy to, to base your paper, uh, your own results on this paper, but I would again, not trust this completely. Now moving on to type three duplications where there's duplicated elements or alterations of a photo. These, this is a, one of my favorite cases where there were photos of a uh, a laser treatment um, showing patients before the laser treatment um, with brown spots in their face, and then the magic laser would get rid of the spots. And then they were showing the photos of the patients months after the laser treatment to show that the brown spots were gone. And yes, they're gone. But if you look carefully, as a reader noticed, these photos appear to look the same. They're the exact same. The guy is wearing the same shirt, uh, the hairs of his and the fine lines around his eyes are exactly the same. It's just the photo is cut slightly differently. 
and um, the, the, the bars on the eyes are slightly different, but the rest of the photo is surprisingly the same, and except for the, um, the presence of these brown spots. So I don't know if they were photoshopped in or out. Uh, I don't know which photo is original, but just looking at these photos by eye, you can see that this, is, um, this appears to be photoshopped. And finally, the editor agreed with me and this, this paper got retracted. Um, this is a type three duplication of fungal spores. And again, uh, most of these examples are from biomedical papers, but I hope you can appreciate that some of these spores appear to have been photoshopped. And so they're, they look exactly the same. Um, surprisingly and uh, worryingly, the editor accepted the authors to send in a new set of photos. And so this paper, which in my opinion should have been retracted because this is photo manipulation, uh, this paper got corrected. Um, and so now you'll, you'll see the paper with um, these photos uh, without the Photoshop elements. This is an example from a, a lab in Marseille, which I'll mention later. So this is the same lab that um, promoted hydroxychloroquine as a cure for COVID-19. Um, unrelated to that story, this paper uh, came from the same lab and had this, this photo of a Southern blot, but there's many duplicated elements in this, uh, in this photo and it's well done. You, 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 you can see the duplications, but you cannot really see signs of Photoshopping, but it appears that many parts of this photo are duplicated and uh, changed position. And so um, this is, I think very bad, but um, I, uh, it, the paper is, is not retracted yet. This is still online and it's cited by 116 other studies. Here's an example from science. So these things don't only, only happen in maybe what you think are, are low ball journals. No, this happens in science as well. So this one is actually from um, sort of a famous Dutch scientist. So I'm Dutch myself. And, and so I was very familiar with the work of this person. And he later became, the group leader later became a minister in one of the uh, Dutch governments. And so it's sort of a high impact paper, it's, it's cited 342 times, but there's duplicated elements in these photos that you can see here. So these two photos um, are different, but there's parts of it that appear to be the same. And so this paper got um, retracted uh, more than five years after I reported it, and I had to bang on the door of science several times to, to get it retracted, but they finally agreed that this was not good. And so this is an example from uh, a type three duplication in nanoparticles. At first you might think this is a beautiful photo, but then if you look more carefully, you might see all kinds of duplicated elements. And these things also happen in plots. So this is a flow cytometry image. And if you look careful, um, you might start to see that some of these elements in these plots have been duplicated. And so you can see that um, parts of these plots are present in uh, part of the constellation of these dots are present in all three plots, uh, all three plots, or they are duplicated within the, the panel. And so this one I also reported and there's no action taken. This is a, a, a photo from um, a spectrum, uh, some, some, some plots. And uh, if you look at it, you see peaks and you see noise and there appear to be duplications in the noise part. And so, it appears that parts of this plot have been photoshopped and made to look uh, sort of, uh, this plot is sort of generated out of a, a Frankenstein monster of, of different uh, elements. And so this paper actually got retracted um, within a year. That's reasonably fast, I guess, in terms of uh, scientific publishing. And yeah, this, this doesn't look like a, a naturally obtained plot. So I did this work for uh, a while, um, well, I still do it, but I did it first, I wanted to know what the prevalence was. How many times would you find such duplications? So I did a very systematic search of 20,000 papers, all from the biomedical literature, focusing on molecular biology papers, sort of things I would understand myself. And I scanned these 20,000 papers by eye, um, looking for these types of duplications within a paper, and I found 800, around 800 papers to contain such duplications. My two co-authors, Arturo Casadeval and Frederick Feng, are both um, editors-in-chief of journals, and so they were very helpful and had a lot of experience, and they both had to agree 
with my findings before we could call it a duplication. So sort of helping each other, um, not making any false positive calls. And so that is 4% of these papers that I looked at had these duplications. And we estimated that about half of these, 2%, were done intentionally. And that is sometimes hard to know for an individual paper, but we had 800 papers. So we had a fairly good idea that it was about half. Now, does that mean that there's 2% of fraud in all papers? Can we extrapolate that to different fields that are not biomedical papers? That is hard to know, but I do wanna say that um, uh, fabrication of data, faking data in other types of uh, figures or, or, or data uh, elements is much easier than it would be in photos. And if a person is a very good Photoshopper, I would not detect it, or if they would use a photo from a different paper or a catalog of a, a monoclonal antibody company, I would not know that either because I scan these things by eye and I can only recognize duplications uh, within a limited set of papers. So I do think that alteration um, and fabrication in other type of data is much easier than the ones I recognize. And I'm probably only looking at the tip of the iceberg. And that is scary because it might mean that maybe up to 5% or even 10% of papers might contain fraudulent data. And that is a scary number, although you could turn it around and say that you could still trust 90% of data. But I do think that fraud is much more common than uh, I would have guessed initially. And it's, it's something to be aware of. Um, but what is even more concerning to me is not just the, the fraud, but the lack of response from, uh, from the scientific publishers. Uh, as I as you have, might have seen from the examples, journals are very slow to respond. So my initial set of almost 800 papers that are reported to the journal in 2014 and 15, I made up the balance after waiting five years. What happens to these papers that are reported? Are they corrected? Are they retracted? What is going on? And unfortunately, I found that in two thirds of the cases, no action had been taken. And I have been sending reminders to these journals saying, hey, can you, don't forget me, I, I, I sent these things a couple of years ago, can you look at it? So in two thirds of the cases, the journal did not take any action. 27% um, were corrected, 7% were retracted after five years, and there's a tiny sliver of expression of concern, which is a tool that is not used a lot, but should be. So yeah, two thirds of these papers have not been corrected after waiting so many years. And by now I've reported many more papers. I'm over 6,000 papers that I found. Um, and I reported uh, around 2,600 uh, to the journals and institution. And these papers, all these concerns have in total led to 860 retractions and about a thousand corrections. I'm still scanning the literature to which papers have been corrected uh, periodically. So that's, that's a lot of retractions and corrections that my work has resulted in. But it's not enough because many more of these problems could have been uh, corrected or retracted, but the journals seem to be very slow to respond. And so out of frustration, I'm starting to post these things just online. It seems to be almost no, uh, there's, there's almost no point in sending it to the editors if they're not responding to it. So uh, I use poppeer.com, which I believe is currently the best way to flag potential problems in papers. And so I've reported around 5,000 of these papers on Papier. And Papier has a nice um, plugin that you can use. Uh, it's a little program that runs in the background in your browser or in your reference manager. And if you, for example, do a literature search, you might see the papers that have been flagged by these green banners. And you can click on them and see what people had to say about these papers. Now, many of these concerns shared on Papier are image concerns uh, because they're they're so visible, but there can also be all kinds of other problems like ethical problems, uh, statistical flaws, or just genuine questions to the authors. And the authors can respond uh, on the platform. Uh, a person can make the comments completely anonymously and, um, and it's heavily moderated. So you cannot just yell misconduct or you're a fraud. No, there's a very strict rules about what you can and cannot say. So you are allowed to say, Figure 2a looks unexpectedly similar to figure 3c, but you cannot say these are duplications and, and you're a fraud or things like that. So there's 
you have to remain polite and objective as much as possible. Although sometimes we do sneak in some sarcastic comment. So uh, you might, you might I, I often get the question, like, can we use AI or like some software to detect these duplications? And the answer is yes, we can, but it's much harder than you might think. So I found most of the examples I've shown you by eye, but I'm starting to use software. I know obviously publishers are very interested in using software to, to find these problems. So um, there are many groups working on this and I'm exactly, I'm, for example, using Image Twin a lot. So that's my, my I, I don't have access to most of these tools, but Image Twin was developed by Marcus Slebinger uh, in Vienna. And he has given me access to this tool and it's, it's working pretty well for, for some of these duplications. So the example I showed you earlier in science was easily found by Image Twin. So it marks these area like I do as well with colored boxes. And it shows that there's a duplication in this, this particular figure. There's other software forensically also would recognize. So it, it works slightly differently, but it has a lot of false positives. So you can play with the settings but it does find the similarity between these two areas as well. And so uh, unfortunately, AI can also not just be used to detect these problems. Unfortunately, it can also be used to generate fake images. And if you don't believe that, uh, I'm sure you, most of you have heard of, of uh, AI to uh, generate images that of people who do not exist. And so this is uh, thispersondoesntexist.com website. Uh, it's using uh, GAN technology, Generative Adversarial Network. It's a machine learning technique. Basically, very simply said and not completely correctly, correctly it, it's generating a new face out of a library of uh, facial elements. And so it's, it's to the point, it's pretty good as of now. It's, um, you might still see some flaws in these photos, but they look surprisingly real. And if you realize how much of our brain and eyes and the combination thereof is focused towards facial recognition, which I'm actually very bad at, but we, we, we look at these faces and they, the background might look weird, but the faces themselves are pretty good. And so this technology um, is already so good in generating faces. Well, how easy uh, is it then to, to fool scientists in generating uh, a fake uh, image of a, of a Western blot, a protein blot, or microscopy images? And it's actually very good in doing that as well. And so there are already papers out there where uh, artificial intelligence has been shown to generate images that look fairly realistic. Maybe you could still detect some, some problems in it, but um, I think we have reached the stage where we can no longer distinguish uh, real from fake. And this is not just true in science, it's true in journalism, um, on Twitter. I mean, every day we hear examples of, of fake stories that turn out to be uh, not real uh, based on, on photos that are fabricated. And so I uh, am convinced this has already been happening for a while in scientific papers. We have found these, um, these sets of papers, huge sets of papers and this is work, again, I want to give credit to lots of other people doing uh, this. I, this was not my own discovery, although I have worked in finding more of these papers. But this is a set of 600 papers that um, uh, use these, these fake bands, protein bands, that all look fairly unique. But they made the mistake, the fraudsters made the mistake of using the same background, which is how we recognize them. And so we found a, a set of 600 papers that were all generated from the same source. And these papers are being sold to authors who need them. And so we call these scientific paper mills. These are sort of organizations that uh, fabricate papers that make completely fake papers. They're written by ghost writers. They're based on a template. So they're very similar, but they, they're not similar enough to use, for example, textual similarity, although sometimes that works, but they use either artificially generated photos or real photos, but, but they sell these photos to different sources and make them look like different experiments. And so these scientific paper mills are found in China, in Russia, in Iran. The one I just showed you is a paper mill from China. And this is because these, these countries have very strict uh, regulations. Uh, for example, medical doctors need to publish a paper in order to get a position at a clinical hospital, which is an impossible requirement because they don't have time to do research. And so they will invest some money in buying a paper 
buying an authorship, buying that their name can be on a paper, but the paper itself is fabricated. So this was a, uh, a group effort. Lots of people worked on that. So I have their names listed here. Um, as an example of another, another example of a paper mill image, um, these are graphs from four different papers, uh, all from different hospitals in China, different groups of authors, um, different, um, different topics, different cancers, different patient groups. But the graphs are all uh, pretty similar, as you might uh, appreciate. And so um, it takes a lot of screening of papers to, to find all these uh, similarities. But at some point, you start to recognize them. And so we believe this data is completely fabricated. And as another example, here's a, a, a table. Um, this is also from a group of papers that have very similar tables. But in one case, it's prostate cancer. In one case, it's colon cancer or breast cancer. The cancer changes, the molecule changes, the patient numbers changes. But in this particular case, the, the writers, the ghost writers of this paper made a mistake. So they had a paper about prostate cancer. They changed it maybe from gastric cancer to prostate cancer, but they forgot to change the, the gender ratio of the patients. So you would not typically expect half of your prostate cancer patients to be female. That is a, a, a very unusual finding. And so uh, this paper got retracted, but very often, you sort of know that a paper might be a paper mill production, but there's no uh, obvious error like this. But this is an obvious error that should have been caught during peer review. But yeah, these papers just slip through because I guess nobody really pays attention to the actual data. And so, and then sort of um, switching topics again a little bit, of course, with COVID-19, with the past two years, um, the world has been in a crisis, there was a big pandemic, there was a new virus, how do we deal with that? We've seen an enormous amount of publications on COVID-19. It seems that everybody um, wanted to write a paper about COVID-19. So we've seen enormous amounts of publications and not all of them are, uh, will stand the test of time. There were lots of editorials, hastily written uh, opinion pieces. And we've also seen a lot of retractions and a retraction watch, which is a website that follows retractions also has a spe special category for COVID-19 related retractions. I don't think the amount of the percentage of retractions is higher or lower than in other fields, but we have just seen so many COVID-19 papers um, that were very hastily written and peer reviewed or not peer reviewed at all. So in particular, one paper made a huge impact on, on public health policies. And that is a paper from a lab in Marseille um, where the, the, the leader of the institution claimed that hydroxychloroquine was very good in treating patients. And it was a very small paper, uh, like, like less than uh, 40 patients. And the paper had a lot of flaws. And I wrote a critique about that paper because I didn't think it was very good. There were lots of problems with it. Uh, it was very small, but yet because President Trump tweeted about it, uh, it, it immediately lots of people wanted to take hydroxychloroquine as a prophylaxis. Uh, big countries like Brazil, the US, India, all started, uh, the doctors started prescribing hydroxychloroquine. Uh, and then there were other papers claiming it did not work. And then most famously, there was a paper published in The Lancet claiming hydroxychloroquine did not work that turned out to be complete fake and that is now uh, retracted. And actually the, the author of that paper, I found this beautifully Photoshopped image in uh, one of his PhD papers, uh, but the journal and the institution didn't think it was worth retracting. Uh, and I'm still mad about that because I, I think this is, you know, basically it's like, it looks like Photoshop Melba toast. I don't think this is real science. And then there were papers claiming that 5G technology can cause COVID by penetrating skin cells and generating new virus particles. I don't know why it generated hundred dollar bills, but specifically they thought that 5G would make new coronavirus particles. This is also not really how biology works, but these papers got accepted and, and um, led to retractions. And altogether, this has led to an enormous uh, erosion of the trust of public in science. So. I do think it's important to publish things very fast during a pandemic, but I do also think we went overboard and there should have been better peer review. Now, because I, I criticized the, the French doctor who had written the hydroxychloroquine paper, 
he actually wasn't happy with that. And I can totally understand that, that he wasn't happy, but he actually, instead of providing the data and, and taking away my concerns, and I found many other problems in many of his papers, he is actually threatening me with a legal, uh, a legal case. He has filed a complaint uh, with the procureur in Marseille, and he uh, has written several blog posts and, and did tweets uh, saying uh, that I would be uh, prosecuted and I would be found guilty of harassment and blackmailing him. Um, I'm not quite sure what it's based on. Uh, I don't think there's any legal uh, truth in that, but it is very threatening for me as a person who is not backed up by an institution um, because I might, I might be 100% right, but these legal cases could financially ruin me. But I am willing to take that risk because I do feel... As scientists, we should be able to criticize other scientists' work. If we see big problems, we can raise them. And then the other scientists might be taking away the concerns, might show original data or approval or, yeah, take away my concerns, but don't threaten me immediately with a legal uh, case. If I, uh, even if I'm a, just a small scientist who has not published any papers, uh, I am able to criticize other scientists' work. And uh, I don't think that these scientific debates should be fought in the, in the courtroom. They should be fought in the scientific arena. But yeah, we, we'll see how this goes. Uh, I haven't received uh, any official uh, lawsuit. So, but yeah, it worries me. And uh, I, I do hope, and I did get a lot of support from the scientific community. So there were lots of people uh, uh, signing, uh, to petitions to support my work. And um, so that has helped me a lot. And I'm very happy that I have received that support. So this is my final slide. I've talked about image duplications and I do wanna point out again that not all of these publications or problems are necessarily misconduct, but some of them are. And we should, we should be a little bit more aware that there's misconduct in, in, uh, in, in science. The percentage of misconduct is hard, obviously, to, to estimate. There have been some uh, questionnaires, uh, for example, um, the uh, Amsterdam, like there were several um, questionnaires sent out in the Netherlands where people could answer if they had ever done misconduct and anonymity was guaranteed. But you can imagine that not everybody would agree or admit that they did misconduct. But it seems that the real percentage of misconduct might be in the five to even seven or eight or maybe even 10% range. And that's, that's a scary thought. Um, I've talked about why do people do this, uh, the pressure to publish, the, the bullying professor, the, the taste of success. Um, there's many reasons uh, for doing misconduct and, and all of these appear to be in a way caused by the pressure to publish. Um, I think science is a slow process if we, measure scientists by the amount of output that they produce, that is not necessarily the best way because some science is slow. And we, if, we, if we just judge people by how many papers they published in a particular time frame, that might drive some people to do fraud. There's lots of conflicts of interest. Uh, publishers, institutions um, don't always seem to be motivated to investigate these cases. And whose role is it to detect misconduct because I'm an unpaid volunteer funded through Patreon, but I do feel this responsibility lies with the scientific publishers. I also hope there's some legal protection for people like me. And then finally, there's a tremendous cost of misconduct uh, because it, it not only is bad for science, scientists themselves, but the general public uh, might uh, or already some of them have lost their, their faith in science. And um, these cases of science misconduct further erode that. And we've seen in the past two years of what that can do. So I do wanna hopefully end on a positive note. Yes, there are people, there is fraud in science, but there are lots of people who care about this. And we, we try to change the system and make it better because we need science to, to help all of us on this planet to face uh, pandemics or to deal with climate change. We need science and we need science to be back at its core, which is finding the truth. And with that, you can follow me on Twitter. I am um, Microbiome Digest and I play a game so you can win an emoji award if you're the first person spotting a duplication. Thank you so much.
Thank you, Elizabeth. That was really fascinating, important, and I think it's sobering talk. Uh, we've got lots of questions in. Uh, I think you triggered some good questions there among people. Uh, we'll just go through a few of these. So first one for you, Elizabeth. Um, are there experts in other fields, apart from biomedical, I presume, doing similar work? Uh, and is that something that's likely to emerge? Yes, there, there are several other people who uh, focus on other types of problems. Um, I do think with photos, it's fairly easy to point them out. So it's, it's easy. We can just take the photo, put our colored boxes around it. But with other problems, it's sometimes a little bit harder. And, and these things might take much more time, for example, to work on statistical problems. There's many others doing it. I'm one of the very visible ones, but there's, uh, there's, yeah, there's many others working behind the scenes and posting papers on papier, yes. Because presumably you need somebody in every field ultimately to do this properly. That's right, that's right. I'm not an expert in, in chemistry or math. And so I hope there's other people feeling responsible. And I always say, if you see something, say something. Don't, don't turn the other way. Please post it on papier and make other people aware that there's a problem. Okay, um, now let's see now. Okay, next one. Uh, what suggestions does Dr. Bix have to help reduce the instances of this type of research misconduct occurring in the first place? And as a follow up, there's a, is the scientific community becoming more aware and more vigilant? Um, yeah, so there's, there's, there's several measures we can take. I've, I've, I think, first of all, we need to take away the strong pressure to publish. Um, countries like China who have impossible requirements to uh, have a paper published, even if you're not interested in doing research, those things are all driving fraud. Not because people are more fraudulent in China, but because of particular incentive structures. So those are the first thing we, I hope we can change. Um, and then we also need to have some stronger um, uh, punishments, I guess, or penalties for doing this. I feel there, there's just not enough punishment. And I, like I said before to you, when we talked privately, like, like if you think about how, um, if we drive through a red light, um, you know, that will in the end make us come a, a little bit quicker at our end goal. Uh, we'll reach our destination a little bit further. But um, if we risk the uh, a penalty, a, a, a traffic ticket, that will actually keep us in, in place. So if there's no penalties, uh, if you imagine there's no penalties or tickets in traffic, we would all be driving way too fast and, and running red lights. And that would not be a good thing for obvious reasons. So we need better penalties also in science. Unfortunately, many of these people who have been caught just receive a very tiny warning and can keep on doing science and we need to change that yeah because in sports where we i guess right. a lot of us do, you know i watch sports a lot and i'm at the stage now sadly i do i believe a gold medal winner <laughs> is clean i don't know right. i probably don't actually i try and pretend i do but no right so we don't want this in science so in sport i mean they now have people that are banned for life i think maybe banned for a couple of years they tried that i mean do we have to go down that road um, yeah, I do believe so. If you want to keep sports clean, and like we've seen this with the Tour de France, there were many years where nobody seemed to really care how people reached, uh, became a winner. Uh, and then suddenly there was sort of a, a change in the way that, um, you know, doping tests were interpreted or executed and the, the consequences it had if you were caught. And so I do believe that that's a good thing in the end for, for sports. It keeps it clean. It keeps it fair and equal. And uh, if we we need to have that similar change of mindset in science. Yeah, because maybe they're just not going to change if, they, if they're doing that. Mm -hmm. And just to move on to the next one, if 4% of papers show error, I assume they, there are repeat offenders within this, okay, which gets to what I'm kind of getting at. Does this mean less than 4% in terms of research teams? Oh, that, that would be a difficult to answer question, but I, I can tell that people who were caught once have a higher chance of being caught twice. And so, yes, you do see these problems um, in particular laboratories. So I imagine this is a case where there's a bullying or like very demanding professor who, where you can see different first authors. And I usually assume that the person who makes the photo is the first author, not the last more senior author, but, but it seems to be the case that, that there's labs where this happens much more than other labs. 
if you look at the retraction board, the leaderboard of retraction watch, um, I believe the, so the, the people who've had the most retractions, so those are usually senior authors. Um, and, and so those are people who have up to, you know, 50, 60 retractions from their lab. Yeah. And also, if you're part of a team and you're innocent, you know, like this sports analogy, again, if you're if you're part of a team and you're innocent and that team member has been found, your colleague has been found cheating, that that's bad for you. Right. It is. And and these cases can be devastating, uh, not just for the, the people who are also an author on the paper and had no idea. And, and I think this happens quite often but also anybody who worked in that lab. If you're a graduate student who hasn't published yet and suddenly your PI has 10 retractions and, and nobody wants to work again uh, ever again with that lab, um, then as a graduate student, you're you're in a very bad situation because now suddenly, like I've worked at Ubiome, like your resume yeah, yeah. is, is, is tainted and, and you weren't even guilty. And uh, misconduct ruins careers, not just of the people doing it, but of so many other people. And so that's why I'm always respectful of the names and the, you know, try not to point fingers uh, and name names. Yeah, sure. Um, okay, so a question I asked you earlier in private and uh, somebody's asking here, Dr. Bix might cover, uh, sorry, how does she deal with the harassment and abuse she receives from questioning papers? Yeah, well, that's, well, we've seen in the past two years yeah. that scientists and, and everybody seems to be a little bit more rude these days. And uh, so I, yes, I noticed that. And I know that the work I'm doing is not uh, always going to be appreciated. Of course, nobody likes to be criticized. So I totally get that people, companies or labs who are um, where I might've found problems in papers that they don't like that. But um, there have been se several groups, organized efforts sort of, you know, trying to troll me, trying to denigrate me. So I've had posts written about me uh, with, you know, things that are not true. People are trying to take down my Wikipedia page or edit it. And um, people are uh, making uh, derogatory videos about me. I mean, it, it, in the end, yeah, I mean, it's, it's tough. And I, I will not lie that that eats on you. It, um, but it also tells me that I might be right because I feel when, I criticize an author when I raise concerns about something, the author could take away my concerns. But if they, if they lash out immediately to me, if they're trying to discredit me, that might mean they don't have any answers and I might be right. And so that's sort of what I try to keep in mind. Um, and I try to still remain polite. Like, I mean, it's, it's tough when people say untrue things about you um, your immediate response is to defend yourself, but yeah, I mean, you, you, you just hope that it will go away, but some of these groups are pretty persistent. They can go on for more than a year. Yes. Yeah. It's nearly like being a journalist. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think there's many similarities. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, what, what is your experience with institutions taking effective action, uh, stroke lacking to take effective action to address misconduct, scientific misconduct? Well, my experience is that actually publish our publishers are, are slowly changing their course, are actually getting better in retracting papers, but institutions are, are lagging. They're, they're still more out there to protect their, their staff, their faculty. And so case after case of uh, uh, concerns that I had about sets of papers from a particular lab, are being dismissed so they're being investigated by the institution but very often they come to the conclusion yeah there were some errors made but it wasn't misconduct and uh, you know no action is taken while i'm looking at these photoshop images i'm like how did this happen by mistake like that's done intentionally and so it seems that there's a lot of things being swept under the rug just to you know keep everybody safe and that needs to change. It's 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 and the publisher are, are starting to change, but the institutions are not yet there. And uh, eventually, they will be more embarrassed if these cases come come to light. But yeah, we need we need more improvement and more yeah. speed in in addressing these cases. Yeah, it takes time to put the pressure yeah. on. And um, what do you think of the impact of precarity? I don't know that word. Precarity. 
on the I'm not word either. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure what that means. But I'll, I'll ask you a question. I think we've come to the end there of the question. Just one from myself. Uh, what, what's the potential solution here? There's a lot of vested interest. There's a lot of powerful interests involved and reasons why it's happening and something big has to happen. Uh, who's going to be the driver? How might things change? Well, it's not something one person can do by themselves. We need to all agree, uh, or like the majority of scientists need to agree that we that fraud in science should have consequences, that that's not what science should be about. We need to agree that we don't, we, we do care about this. And, and, and similar to the analogy we talked about earlier in sports, like at some point, uh, sports started to care about doping misuse and and but before that was sort of yeah everybody doesn't like we don't really care we looked the other way but at some point there was a mindset change similarly with the me too movement you know we've seen sexual harassment and uh all kinds of of, of nasty things done by people in power and um, that was the sort of the genius argument. Oh, but this person is a genius. Let them do their thing. Yeah, they, they you know, we will just look the other way. Be because, but they're so great. And we have something similar in science where uh, very often the argument is, but they did great, great science. They have so many publications. They have a huge age index. They brought in so much money for our university. We need to, 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 to not make that, um, uh, justify bad things. Like we should agree, all of us should agree that we, uh, even if a person has done a ton of good work, like there are certain things that they should not do and there should be consequences. Uh, I'm not yeah. sure if, uh, you know, I hope yeah. to, to, to contribute to this mindset change. And I know I have some influence because I have a large Twitter account, um, but we need to all do it together. We cannot just do it as a one person job. Maybe there has to be something like uh, Ben Johnson, if you remember him moment from the 1988 Olympics where he wins the 100 meters and he's this huge character and does it very spectacularly, but he's clearly cheating. So, you know, is it, I just wonder, is it going to take like a Nobel Prize winner to be outed for fraud before anything moves? <laughs> Sure, there's a couple there. <laughs> there's a couple so, there. There you. Yeah, I'm well, you sure, mentioned. I'm sure. <laughs> you mentioned. I, I, you mentioned I, science. You mentioned Science Magazine, and I saw Yale, and you know. So this is not just uh, the minor journals. This is at the top as well. This is. This happens everywhere. Um, I do think that people publishing in Science and Nature are better cheaters, and so yeah, uh, they're you know, probably they're, just better. Yeah, they're just better cheaters. Uh, yeah, I'm. I'm really only catching the tip of the iceberg. There's many ways to fraud uh, that are not visible and I can only catch the tiny amount, you know, the dumb fraudsters who leave some traces for me to find. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm convinced this happens much more than anybody uh, expected. It's not always, doesn't always have huge consequences, but it's something we should, we should not be, uh, uh, we should not be ignoring. And a final one that's just come in here. Um, is there a pr proportion of false positive errors in your own research? Have you ever found something which looked very similar, but which which was not actually identical or overlapping? Yes, I, I, I do make mistakes. I hope the, the amount of po false positives errors I make are, uh, are low. Uh, and this is what you know, teaming up with my two co-authors, Arturo Casadeval and Farrak Feng, helped me a lot to, to uh, calibrate myself that I don't call out things that are just, just looking similar. So I will usually frame it as these things look very similar, but sometimes I'm not quite sure the resolution of an image might be too low, but I'm, I'm always right in saying these things look similar. It sort of keeps me out of legal trouble. I try not to say these things are identical. And so they look similar and the authors can take away my concern by showing the originals, but they don't often. In most cases, they don't show me the originals, maybe because there are no originals. These are Photoshopped images. So I, um, people have said that my error rate is pretty low. I don't wanna to brag too much, but I, yeah, I mean, I've made some mistakes where images are identical, but they, and the labels look different, but I misinterpreted. So that has happened in, uh, I would say, maybe 10 cases or so, but but now I have like 6,000 and I hope I've built up a reputation of not calling out too many false positives and doing it in an objective way. These things look similar to me. Uh, just explain if they are supposed to look similar or not. And if the author doesn't reply, then 
maybe there are no real answers. Yeah. And if they do reply, then they obviously want to, uh, you know, correct us or to explain. Yeah. Yeah. But it's yeah. very rare that that happens. But there have been a couple of cases where people said, yes, these are in the, indeed the same photos and the labels are different, maybe a little bit confusing, but they are the same experiments. And so uh, then I'm like, great, that's fine. Like, you know, that's, uh, uh, I'll move on to the next paper. But uh, yeah, that's that doesn't happen very often, unfortunately. <laughs> And for, I'm thinking of the general public now, rather than maybe a lot of the audience we have here, why why should they care about this, the average person? Why should they care about this issue? Because eventually science will lead to, to things that all of us have to deal with, you know, like, like um, uh, new insights in public health or like new materials that we can use, uh, new medications that can be used for patients to treat certain diseases. Um, new technology and I don't know, like self-driving cars or stuff. Uh, maybe we don't want that or we do, but like, like all technology and all, all, all medicine is based in the end on, on scientific papers. And so scientific papers sort of move us forward, lead hopefully to improvements. And so if some of these science papers are based on fraud, um, maybe it doesn't necessarily lead to some big improvement or some big technology or drug. But in the end, we all base each other's research on, on those papers. And so uh, it, it definitely will lead to a lot of wasted time, wasted research money by other groups trying to replicate that results. And in the end, it's all, you know, research is funded by taxpayers. So it's a waste of money. Um, and sometimes a, a false story uh, bringing a false narrative into the world. So yes, we okay. should all care about that. We should care, yeah. Yes. Okay. So I, I think that's probably, uh, oh. To, 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 to. Oh, just to say, um, yeah, if people want other information, uh, to email uh, comms at dais, communications at dais. So, uh, I don't think we I said that before, so that's fine. So, thank you very much. I found the talk fascinating, I must say, I'm sure everybody else did too. Um, so maybe I'll hand back now to somebody in the dais office there if they want to round it up or finish it off. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Very welcome. Good evening. Uh, so my name is uh, Yukari Amih and I'm the CEO and Register. So I just want very briefly uh, to thank Elizabeth very much for her very um, insightful uh, presentation and for, I suppose, casting a light uh, this evening on, I suppose, an area of science that we don't we don't really hear about um, very often, particularly in the public uh, in the public domain. So I think you've given a very good overview of what type of issues can arise and uh, under consequences. And, and indeed, um, I think in being completely fair to people outlining how sometimes these kinds of things can, uh, can arise. So thank you for, for, for shining a light on an area we should all be concerned about, whether we are in, in research performing institutions or whether we're members of the public. So thank you so much for your time. Um, Sean, I'd like to thank you also for uh, for obviously being a master of ceremonies uh, this evening and for giving your time and for moderating uh, the questions. And finally, of course, to thank everyone uh, for attending. And as Sean has said, if you have any follow up questions, contact communications at dias.ie. And also, if you are interested in hearing about any of our other events and lectures, contact also that email and we can put you on our mailing list. So I'd like to wish you all um, a very good evening. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you.